Welcome to the Fabricators Coach Podcast, where we believe that every fabricator deserves to have a business that not only makes the money, but also gives them time to enjoy it. In each episode, our goal is to share real information that you can take action on and use today, information that, if you will use it, can help you reduce the chaos in your business, help you make more money, and help you get your life back. My background, for those of you who don't know me, is I've got uh, over 40 years experience in manufacturing, business, ownership, coaching, work with uh, hundreds of companies in a lot of different industries. I've been in this industry for 20 years, um, and I've owned my own brick and mortar business. So I understand for you owners out there, how lonely it can be as an owner. I uh, ran a countertop shop, as I just mentioned, for a few years. So I've uh, I've been in this fab shop life myself and understand a lot of the, a lot of the challenges here. So it's a lot of fun. The good news is I haven't run across any challenges in this industry that can't be fixed. So if you've got problems, uh, be, be encouraged that there are solutions. Uh, the article we're going to talk about today is the one that came out first this month from Slippery Rock Gazette. If you haven't read it, would like to get a copy, you can hit slipperyrockgazette.net, uh, select current issue and get this article. If you if you like this one, want to see past articles, they have an archives tab, you can go hit that. And obviously, you can go to our website, um, at fabricatorscoach.com, select blog, and then all the articles are there to download or, and take a look at as well. And, and the title of this article is, how do we get to the next level? It's part of a, uh, a number 10 in a 12-part series for this year. The whole idea was, you know, as, as my wife and I ran a, a countertop shop on the eastern shore of Maryland just before the beginning of the, of the Great Recession, you know, our, our big seasonal challenge was that fourth quarter. People coming in the week before Thanksgiving wanting to have new tops in the kitchen, you know, before the family gathered for Thanksgiving dinner. I know none of you have ever had that challenge, um, but it's something we see a lot in this industry, of course, with fourth quarter. And I got to thinking last year about how crazy that time was for us. And I thought, okay, so what can we do for 2022 to help make that holiday season better for folks, um, you know, this year than it was last year? And of course, the whole challenge is, finding ways of making suggestions to help you start working on your business and not being just in your business all the time. I think it's really, really critical. I think it's very important that as you work on improving your business, the closer you get to having a business that not only makes you money, but also gives you time to enjoy it. Because I think that's, you know, that's, if you can't enjoy what you're doing, what's the point, right? Uh, you may be making some money, but if, if it's consuming all of your waking time, then then that's not much fun. So I want to offer some suggestions, and that's what this series of articles has been about this year. So let me ask a question. How many of you feel like you just can't get away from your business, that the business is running you instead of you running it? Anybody here in that that situation? I used to be this way. Diana. So what was that? What was that like? Uh, it was stressful because even if you go on a little vacation over the weekend, you have your phone with you. You're always on the phone. You, my husband was very mad about it. <laughs> um, yes, you can fully relax. And, and I have a strong sense of control because I feel like if I, you know, let it go, other people won't be able to control it as good as I do. That's why I was always constantly, even on vacation, I was trying to oversee the operations and make sure everybody's happy, the clients are happy, uh, the fabricators are doing their job properly. Um, and that, yeah, in, in the long term, yeah, maybe it's good for a few years. You can work and operate this way. But then in the long term, you understand that this is kills all of your energy and um, your work is just around you 24 seven. And there is no other pleasures in life, like your family spending the quality time with your loved ones. Um, that was me <laughs> for the last five, five years. Well, it's uh, it, it's certainly a tough way to live. No question about that. So a couple of key points from the article. One of them is this question. Are you a fabricator? Do you see yourself as a fabricator or do you see yourself as a business owner? So definitely a fabricator trying to be a business owner. 
Gotcha. Okay. Well, I'm I'm a business owner, but I like going into the shop here and there, time to time, once a year or so. You know, <laughs> I like polishing stones. Okay. All right. I'm a business owner acting as a fabricator. <laughs> All right. You want you want to elaborate on that one? Oh, well, uh, the day to day involvement. You know, Pilsen to be. I mean, it's not that I I do the polishing or cutting anymore, but we are involved in the business so much um, uh, that that. It, it it it's what it is kind of sometimes but but it does um, take a toll on you over a period of time I've been doing this for 22 years now um, uh, we definitely go back and forth thinking that now we should not be doing all these day-to-day activities but then something goes wrong somewhere and then you get yourself involved because we care about business uh, I mean it is this stuff to imagine sometimes that we cannot separate ourselves from the operations, but then, you know, you you try to do it, and then you, um, you definitely you want it to be on the hat of a business owner. You want to wear that all the time, and then keep distance from the business. But then, then when you know things are not to our expectations, then we get pulled into the day-to-day operations. So it's kind of a mixed feeling for me. I don't mind doing that, but again, there is there should be certain checks and balances and limits put in place that way you're not getting dragged into the operations all the time. Absolutely. So, and I and I think you've kind of hit on on the answer to my next question, and that's what's what's really the difference between a fabricator and a business owner. Anybody want to want to offer up an opinion? Well, a business owner, I think you 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 think about the business you 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 work on you know developing the business uh, you are not hands on on the day to day operations or cutting or polishing or installation and whatnot i mean you 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 are an oversight on all the stuff but you are not involved in them um, but in reality i don't see that's the truth okay and certainly as an owner you um you can't ignore the fact that sometimes you have to pitch in. No question about that. Um, Diana, did you want to? Did you have something you want to offer in there? Uh, yes, in my opinion, I guess the difference between the business fabricator, business owner, is more thinking about long-term goals and to see the overall. Um, production and I guess the overall company well-being in the long term and make decisions based on that versus a fabricator it's like day-to-day operational um, I guess day-to-day um, operations that you oversee and um, do in fabrication installation um, in my opinion business owner is like a little bit bigger role okay all right anybody else want to offer an opinion Okay. Thank you guys have, have hit around it pretty well. To me, it's, it's a mindset question. It's not so much a technical question. You know, when you look at, uh, at, at being a fabricator for me, when I, if I walk into a shop and it's tough to tell, tough to distinguish the shop owner from the employees, the uh, only way I can tell that they're maybe a shop owner is that their stress level is higher than everybody else's uh, because that fabricator really can never escape the business. They're, they're like the long pole in the tent. You pull that, that fabricator owner uh, out of the business and that long pole, it's like pulling a long pole out of a tent. The whole tent collapses. Um, as, as some of you have said, they, you know, they, they can never really get a break. Uh, you think about employees. Employees can go home at night. They don't have to worry about the business. Uh, they go take a vacation. Go take a, you know, they don't work over the weekend or whatever, whenever they have a weekend off. They don't stress about the business. That fabricator owner, fabricator slash owner, is constantly thinking about the business and takes it with them everywhere they go. Business owners don't do that all the time. Yeah, once in a while, you got to pitch in and help out with something or, or help take care of a problem. But the key is that business owners are constantly working on how to improve not just the business, but improve how they run the business. I think that's a different, totally different perspective. And the whole goal of the business owner is to have their businesses run without their constant attention. Doesn't mean they never get involved, but it means that 
That's the exception and not the rule. They can get a way to relax, just like an employee can. They can get a way to learn about the business, to learn about business in general, and to learn how to improve how they run a business. And so that, to me, that's kind of the difference between a fabricator and a business owner. And I think uh, those of you who commented, and I appreciate your, comment, appreciate your comments, I think uh, you guys were kind of echoing those those same thoughts. Anybody anybody differ with any of that? Okay, well, good. I think we're all on kind of the, the same page here. The real question. Well, you know, I, let me interrupt it. You know. Sure, sure. So I I act like business owner uh, most of the time. So in, even some days I'm remote. I have a business partner in here, but uh, at points, you know, I guess that's why I'm in this webinar. At points, uh, you know, I'm uh, thinking, you know, okay, uh, is this business really uh, runnable by like, you know, managing like, you know, working on your business rather than working in your business? As you know, as you know, everybody knows this, this type of business has many ends of it from fabricating, from uh, measuring, from, from installation, you know, dealing with customers, dealing with employees, training them and etc. So I guess we are in here to hear from you, you know, uh, what would it take to really be uh, working on the business rather than uh, you know, is, is it really feasible? Is it really possible uh, to work on your business and uh, act like a business owner or this type of business really requires you to be sucked in in it? I have worked with a lot of owner operated manufacturing companies in this industry and others. And I can tell you absolutely, yeah, this business can get crazy at times, but I've not really met an owner-run manufacturing business that isn't crazy at times. I know from experience, personal experience, that the business, this business, the countertop fabrication business can be set up so that you can be a business owner and you do not have to be constantly involved in the day-to-day -day production of orders to go out and service customers. So the, the short answer to your question is, is yes, that transition can be made. Um, a lot of things that I will, I'll talk about today are about folks who are struggling to get to that level. Some of you are already partially there, and we can talk about some more advanced aspects of this as well as we go through. I'll be happy to get into that. Um, so the, the key question, and, I, and, and Ibrahim, you, you, you've been a good straight man there. You've asked that question, you know, how do you make that shift? Can you do it and can you make that shift? And for a lot of, a lot of fabricators that I talk to, they are so consumed in the business, they, they can't stop and think about tomorrow or next week because they are so worried about the now. And for those folks who, who don't have any time to themselves at all, some of you listening to you talk, You've been able to kind of start to make this shift, but you haven't fully made it yet. But where you start with this is setting business goals. You know, what is it that you want your business to do by the end of this year? What do you want it to achieve next year? Is that a top line sales goal? Is that a net profit goal? Is it both? Um, you know, what, is, what does that look like? And one of the key to setting goals is to have some way to measure that progress. How do you know when you get there? And of course, if you're looking for a top line sales goal, that's a number. And you're looking for profit, that's a number. Some folks will tell me, well, I just need good metrics. Well, great. I can give you a couple of good metrics. Is that sufficient? Uh, some folks will tell me, well, I, I just, it needs to get better. I got too much stress. I need to get my stress level down. How do we measure that? Okay. And so having a metric is critical and having a time deadline is critical because it gives you something specific to shoot for. You want to achieve something specific by the end of 2022 or by the end of 2023 or, you know, the end of each quarter, whatever that is. That's the key to setting these goals. The goal I like the best to talk to business owners about is what's your exit strategy? And I can always tell when I'm talking to a fabricator instead of a business owner because a fabricator typically can't answer that question. Or their question may be, I want to sell this and retire. Well, that's frankly not a good enough goal. Why do you think that might not be a good enough goal to just sell it and retire? 
Well, you usually die when you retire. You know, you need to keep busy as a business <laughs> owner. You know, I don't know. That's at least my character or what I see uh, on people. Uh, I'm not looking to retire. You know, selling is obviously, you know, that would be a nice, you know, it's, I feel like that's a success. You know, you start something up, you grow it and bring it to a point and sell it. That could be an ultimate goal, but that doesn't stop that, uh, that I will be retiring. Understood. And, and understand when I say retire and I talk with folks about exit strategies, it's not sell the business and then sit on the, in a rocking chair on the front porch for the rest of your life. Cause you're, you're right. You will then die very, I think very quickly doing that. My question is always around the, the idea of, okay, what do you want to do when you're no longer doing this business? And that's, that's the question that stumps a lot of fabricators. A, a business owner has a pretty good idea. And, you know, Ibrahim, like you said, you've got some other things that you may want to do once you sell the business. The question is, what kind of money do you need to be able to do those things? I've, I've talked with business owners in the past that are great golfers. And man, when they, when they sell their business, they want to go out and play the great golf courses of the world. And so now we've got the starting point for a goal. We can list those courses. We can list the greens fees, figure out what's going to cost to travel there, stay there for a week or two, whatever. Uh, or somebody says, well, I want to travel a lot. Great. What kind of travel? You want to go around the world? You want to see all the great national parks of the United States? Uh, you know, what is that? And we start putting definition around that goal and figuring, okay, what's it going to cost to be able to do that? And that starts driving us back to, so how much money do you need to net from the sale of the business? And what's that look like? Well, how does that, and then that implies that your business has a certain size and obviously a certain sales value. So then you sit down and look at today, where are we? What's the business worth today? If you were to sell it today, how far are you from that dollar figure that you have to have? And by the way, when's that goal that you want to exit this business by? Is it five years from now, 10 years from now? And so if we set those, we know where we are today in terms of business value and what you net from a sale and say, okay, in five years, I need to net, let's say your business is worth a million dollars today. and you want to be able to sell it in five years for five million. That means now we've got some we've got some goalposts on on the on the, the the ball field. We can we know where we are on the yard line, and we can start putting together a game plan to go from a million in value to five million in value. What are the things that are that are going to that we need to accomplish to get there? So, setting that kind of goal and direction helps helps drive making this shift from a fabricator to a business owner. Well, does that does that make sense? Anybody disagree with that as a really good first step? No, that's a great step. Always you got to start with the goal, you know, and the goal uh, should be always uh, the one that the final goal, you know, just like you are saying, the exit strategy. From the exit strategy, you come down and set your goals up, whatever the goals up, you know, either revenue or the profit margin. I would say mostly. Uh, not only the revenue, because that's the thing that helps you to exit. Yeah, and then when you start looking at, okay, you're going to grow it from being worth a million to being worth five million, then obviously you can't be the person in there performing all of the all of the different processes all the time. So now we got to build a way to start delegating that to other people, and that's that's the key. And so. When you get to this next step is, all right, what are the major obstacles that are keeping you from, from, from achieving whatever goal you set? And the key is to sit down and list those obstacles and then develop a plan to eliminate those obstacles. And the key to success in doing that is take those obstacles one at a time. I run into a lot of people in business that they'll see a, a list of three, four, five things that need to be done or, you know, there are key obstacles preventing them from reaching a goal, whatever that goal is, and they want to go out and gang tackle all of them. And from my experience and, and from a lot of folks you talk to who've been successful achieving goals, one of the keys is to go after one obstacle at a time. Get that laser focus, tackle that one thing. And then develop a plan to take, you know, to eliminate it and then execute on that plan and then repeat. Now, a lot of folks will say, you know, you think about, you know, you analyze all the causes for a problem. You get a list of those and you, 
you do some sort of analysis and figure out, okay, which one has the biggest impact? Same is true for obstacles. Which one could have the biggest impact in reaching that goal? Sometimes the one that has the biggest impact is the hardest one to, to kill, the hardest one to eliminate. And so I like to say that nothing succeeds like success. Sometimes it makes sense to take the easiest obstacle and tackle it first. Because if you can tackle it first and get a little traction, get a little momentum going, get a little success, feel good about that. Folks who aren't used to thinking about setting a goal, putting together a plan and tackling obstacles, this is a great way to kind of get in the rhythm of tackling these one at a time. Take the easiest one and work on it. And then the next one doesn't look so challenging because now you've already got one under your belt. And what I found too, in a lot of cases is as you tackle the easy goals, these, these obstacles tend to kind of interact with each other. So you get the, the easy, simple obstacles out of the way early on. They tend to whittle down the big, hairy ones sometimes and make them easier to accomplish. Not only do you feel more confident in accomplishing them, you've actually made the task smaller and more manageable. And so this taking an obstacle one at a time is really the key to getting out and, and, and making a lot of this progress to moving from a fabricator to a business owner. I kind of think that's the part that gets severely overwhelming at times too, is trying to list the obstacles and trying to figure out what the obstacles actually are to be able to figure out how to prevent them. <clears throat> Once you find out what your goal is and where you want to go, that can get extremely overwhelming and actually take time to try to figure it out is what I found in that area right there. I think you're exactly right. Anybody else struggle with finding the time to do this? Yes. Yeah, that's normal. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest challenges I get is or our biggest questions and pushbacks I get when I'm talking with a, with a client or business owner is just what Shelby said. Hey, I'm, I'm so busy doing that. I don't have time to sit down and, and put together a plan and develop and you know, identify obstacles and that sort of thing. And so, you know, the old, the age old saying of a journey of, you know, a thousand miles begins with one step. I think a really good place to start is to set aside an hour a week that you can work on this and think about this. You may pick a morning where you can stay home at morning for an hour and turn the phone off, turn the computer off and work on this. Maybe you're in the office and you lock the door and turn the phone and the computer off and focus for an hour. Uh, maybe you're getting your truck and you go to lunch and, you know, eat lunch in your truck sitting out somewhere off the road, you know, out of the way of folks and your phone's off so you can focus for an hour. But if you can carve out an hour a week and start making some progress towards this, and as you make more progress, it'll be easier to, to keep that hour. And then when you find it's easier to keep that hour, then go to two hours a week and just continually increase the amount of time you can put into this. And as you start tackling these obstacles, that'll be easier and easier to do. Has anybody ever tried an approach like that where you're just carving out simple steps and just committing to yourself, hey, I'm just going to take an hour a week and I'm going to work on this? I just want all the followers on this. Oh, my bad. Go ahead. Sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, okay. I, mean, I spend a lot of hours, you know, honestly. That's, that's all I do. That's all I do. Develop systems and making sure they work. It's a lot more than an hour a week. But, uh, you know, as I mentioned in obstacles, it's, this is a life uh, business. You, know, you increase your revenue, then, but then your uh, expenses just increase uh, as much, sometimes even more, you know, due to uh, maybe, you know, nowadays is due to pandemic or et cetera. Then, you know, you see, uh, my, I guess I'm talking about my challenges. So you see, you know. I have one in the back, my car back. You want one? No. Sorry, Ibrahim, I think, uh, I think you got muted there. We lost you for a second. You want to unmute? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, like uh, in my case, the challenges, like I mentioned, uh, 
from my uh, previous speech is the uh, profit margins, right? So you increase your revenue, and at the same time, you know, you hope that while you increase the revenue, some of your expenses uh, would uh, come down. But unfortunately, with the pandemic, the things are not slowing down. Then you are seeing the uh, profit margins are uh, doesn't always go uh, as the same level as your uh, revenue. Then you try to find uh, areas to cut the cost or increase your uh, increase your uh, prices. So, but increasing your prices comes with uh, many challenges because you are always competing with uh, other fabricators. And uh, some fabricators may know what the cost of their goods are, and uh, or some may not really know what the cost of their goods are, and they keep a certain price structure. And we just we don't only do residential, you know, we we are mixed, so you probably like sixty five percent business to business and thirty five percent residential. You know, on the residential aspects of it, you know, okay, price uh, could be increased with uh, showing the value that you uh, do in your business, but on the uh, business to business side of it is not that easy. Because there's always another, uh, another company may uh, jump in front of you. Although we've been established, so we have clients over a decade, but uh, you still like to increase your business to business. Uh, uh, so it, you get a const, you know, constant uh, constant business from there. So Ibrahim, if you were to take the things that you just listed, what are your, what are the top two obstacles to you achieving your objective? Well, uh, mine is, uh, I started thinking about this fail within like last two years, uh, automation. So that's all I'm focusing on nowadays. Automation metrics. I see it. We use a software, which is an old software. I'm not really, um, uh, I don't know if it's uh, it's good enough for us yet. So but, is, is uh, automation an obstacle or is it a solution for you? Oh, it's a solution. My bad. Yes. Uh, obstacle. Well, obstacle is. It's, it's kind of got you digging a little bit deeper, doesn't it? That question. Right. You know, exactly. I mean, yeah. there are many obstacles, right? You know, obstacles is the, the market is the obstacle, right? The, you know, uh, is or, the market uh, the obstacle, or is the competition the obstacle, or is it your no, approach to the market that the, that's the obstacle? Or, correct, correct. You are absolutely right. Uh, due to the uh, this, due to the market conditions, uh, competition is the obstacle. Like you know, market in the competition. I'm talking about. So okay. that's the obstacle. And so fabricators. So, and obviously, when you get into the discussion about markets and competition and that, there are a lot of different facets to that. And so when you start, and, I, and I'm thinking about that because we're in the middle of a, a 10-week workshop that we're providing that, that deals with, you know, how do you put your market message, your market identity out there? How do you develop that so that you're unique from your competition? And so it solves your customer's problem. Your customers understand that you can solve their problem without you telling them you're, you're great, but you show them you can solve your problem. And then also we're, we're talking about the specific sales techniques for, you know, how to sell without selling. And we started the whole thing off talking about metrics, using the metrics to quantify which market segments and which customers you should be going after, which are best for your business. So when you get into market issues and competition issues, yeah, those are, those are big, hairy issues, no question. But there are key facets to those that I think, as you have your goal identified, your objective identified, then we need to sit down and say, okay, where are the areas that you're struggling and identify the obstacles to making, to improving those areas. And then that gets us where we're talking about, but that's, that's on the sales side of the business. So it sounds like one of your obstacles is really just increasing your sales. Is that correct? Well, uh, I hundred percent agree uh, what you just said, right? So you uh, have, to, and that's how we sell it, right? We sell, not by selling it, we sell by helping customers. Right. So we, are, we don't sell like, you know, secondhand car dealers. Sales, <laughs> you know? We don't do that. You know, we, yeah. we educate and we spend time and uh, doing that. So, and you are right. So obstacle uh, in our case I don't know if it's obstacle or not, you know, because we are working on it. But yes, increasing the revenue, uh, it's it's our uh, main main goal right now. I don't want to say the obstacle. 
you know, I don't believe in the obstacles. If there's an obstacle, just like you said, you take a note and you handle them one by one. Yeah, but I think from the standpoint of solving problems, if you can't really drill down, understand that root cause, that obstacle, that true obstacle, then it's easy to say, well, here's what I think the solution is and go off and try a lot of different solutions. And you haven't really fully identified the problem. And so that's, you know, while while in, a, in an hour long webinar, we can't get really deep into that. I think the point is, is that really diving into understanding what are the true obstacles to to achieving the goal that you've got out there is really the key. And and as you're talking, you're talking about cost and, and, and revenue, that sort of thing and margins, the metrics that you use are really important. Um, because if um, I can tell you from personal experience, I've done the material cost plus labor cost plus out overhead allocation plus budgeted profit kind of product cost roll up for for uh, selling products. Uh, I've, I've done that in other industries uh, to a large degree. And that standard cost system is great for gap accounting. It's great for bankers and investors and accountants, but it's not a really good business management system. Looking at things like the metric of how fast you generate, how much cash you generate with each order, how fast those orders generate cash for you, and then looking at how fast you're burning cash and using those to help you with daily management can both help with how you run your operations side and you can use some of those, some variations of those metrics to quantify which market segments are really the most profitable for you. Because some segments that you have generate cash for you faster than others and it's not always based on your markup or your discount. Um, I've, I've got data that I've used from a from a client that has let me use his data anonymously. Everybody says, okay, remnants are a great way to make money. I've got some data that may indicate otherwise. So the metrics that you use are really key to all this too. Um, Shelby, I think you had a comment you wanted to, to jump in here with? Talking about obstacles. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Abraham was talking and you were talking. I was asking about, okay, who's ever taken an approach of, you know, carving out an hour a day uh, and, and really focusing? And and I think you were, you said you had some challenges with that, but I think there was something else you were going to offer in there. It was more about how the, instead of an hour a day, it's more so like after five o'clock when everyone goes home or on the weekends is kind of when I spend most of my time planning that stuff. And do you have a do you have a structure around that that you do that like every day or on Tuesdays and Thursdays or anything like that? Mainly Saturdays or game days is what I call them. In my head, at least, is where I spend most of the time with the whiteboard and figuring out where we are with the metrics, what we need, where the system faults are, who needs to do what, who could be doing more, who's not doing enough, and by who I mean the positions rather than the people. Like what position could be juggling this, what position could be handling that. So I'm trying to build our systems based off positions rather than people and then building people to fill that position. Good, good. Yeah, that's key. A lot of folks will, I've, I've walked into shops where the, the whole operation depends on the ability of one person to be able to program a specific machine and they're the only one in the company knows how to do it. So yeah, building it based off positions and not, not, individual people is great and i think having positions rather than people quote unquote it keeps people it keeps it from having one person having to take the brunt of the the business so as a business owner you have all the liability and the burden of it right and then a lot of people that i've learned when they get to the point where they can be the business owners because somebody stepped in and took the the burden for them like so someone's getting there at four in the morning and leaving at 10 o'clock at night and they're taking the brunt of everything rather than having positions set up in the system where the entire business is taking the burden rather than one person, if that makes sense. So as you start looking at positions and you're talking about the burden on one person versus multiple people, and that implies that you've got well-defined roles and responsibilities. Yes, uh, everybody's kind of got their number. They know what it is that they're supposed to accomplish today. Um, are you in the pro are you spending your, your Saturday time setting up systems like that? Yes, sir. And going Good. over what happened that week. And I've got, KR, uh, I've got numbers to look at every week and I look back and see what happened that week. I've got notes or systems set up where they could take notes of what happened on that day. Why did this cycle take that long? Why did this slab get recut? What happened on this install? Why is there a callback? And I can kind of look at that at the end of the week and kind of game plan of what happened with the systems. Did a system happen? Did something out of our control happen, et cetera? 
All right. So the next question then is, you know, you're doing all this for your business. Are there any pockets of your business, any segments of your business? And, and I mean, the, the the company and the employees, any, any groups of those where you've got a key person that's helping with some of this analysis for the area under their span of control? I kind of have a area manager set up. So I've got one guy that handles the machine. So all the saws and the CNCs, he programs for them and kind of has the operators handle what he's programming and kind of manages that. So the overall production of what the machines are producing, he's responsible for that. And then I've got a guy handling a finishing area. So he's making sure the installs are good. And then, right. uh, but this but, after this after action analysis that you're doing on Saturdays, is anybody else participating in that to any degree? Our foreman. Okay, good. Our foreman goes through it and he keeps tabs on all of those processes during the week. And I touch base with him on Saturdays and figure out what happened. Who's feeling what is anybody overwhelmed? Or is somebody carrying way too much? Are they, how are they doing? How are the systems going? All that good stuff. Okay. And you're, you're tracking all that with facts and data, right? Yes, sir. Good. Mainly spreadsheets. I don't have any certain software. It's all, I've got a million spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, as long as you can juggle when they work for you, that's great. Okay. Obviously the things that, that Shelby's talking about are, you know, clearly defined roles and responsibilities and then building the capability of your key people to do the kind of analysis that Shelby was just talking about. So it's not just Shelby doing this for his business. He's got his production manager helping out. If his organization is large enough and he's got a field manager or an ops manager or a sales manager or whoever, you know, those folks are being, their capabilities are being developed and they're coming in and helping build systems and build processes and then doing this after action analysis, preferably on a daily basis is really key. And that's why good metrics that are not standard cost metrics can help you evaluate, uh, did we win the day yesterday or not? You know, there's a, there's a classic structured meeting I like to, to implement with companies where the key people meet first thing in the morning, every morning. Okay, what did we have planned for yesterday and how did it work or not? And what worked, what didn't? And it's not a problem solving meeting. It's a stand up, literally stand up, literally 10 minute structured with the same agenda every day meeting where it's a status meeting. And if an install that was scheduled for yesterday that didn't get completed, the only question is what needs to be done to complete it? Who's responsible for making sure it's going to happen? And when will it be done? And that's it. If there's problem solving another discussion, that happens at another time. This is just a quick status meeting. So that's a, that can be a really big key to, to helping grow people and grow their capability to help carry the load, as, as Shelby was talking about. We just started doing that last week, early last week. Yeah. And it's night and day different. Oh, cool. What are you, what are you seeing that's different? What's, what's getting better? The fires are gone. Everyone knows what's happening at the beginning of the day. Everybody knows what everybody else knows. Everyone knows what's happening in every area. And if something changes, they all know who to call so he can disperse it. And that is also something I can step out of very quickly because our foreman can handle that. The form, I don't have to be there for that meeting and it gets everything running without me. Great. You know, that's, uh, that's great to hear. Glad to hear you're making that kind of progress. That's something that a lot of folks struggle with. And part of that is delegation delegation of responsibility and authority to execute, to make decisions. And part of it is just communicating the right things and focusing on, okay, you know, having run manufacturing plants and owned a business or run businesses, um, I, I can tell you that you, you give me a P&L on the 10th of, the, of October saying, here's how well you did or didn't do for September, you know, make it better. I can't remember what I had for lunch two days ago, much less what I did work-wise two or three weeks ago. So if we can sit down today and say, okay, how did we do yesterday? With the help of people in the business, we can usually kind of remember what happened. And then you put together a game plan to focus on what's really critical, which in this industry, finishing up an incomplete install or taking care of a problem for something that went bad yesterday, that's really the five alarm fire. And then there's other structure you can put in to help, you know, go down to the five alarm, the four alarm, three alarm, so to speak, and work your way down. But it really does give you good focus. And it sounds like, Shelby, you're, you're doing a good job of executing on that. That's great to hear. Thanks, sir. 
Diana, I think you had uh, had a yes comment in the chat. Was there something you wanted to add to this? Uh, no, I think it was for some other question before that. <laughs> we, we, we missed you and moved too far on and now we've forgotten. Okay. If you think of it, holler. We'll uh, apologize for missing it when you, when you brought that up. Oh, no, that's okay. No worries. Okay. It was about the comment of we don't have time. She also agreed that we didn't have time. I remember uh, that coming up. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm, I've got uh, a laptop and two extra monitors open and trying to run PowerPoint and look at my notes. And, and I miss I miss some of these chat comments from time to time. So I apologize. Okay. So I think, a, you know, a big key is, is this simple approach, a step at a time, really pays big dividends. Uh, clients that I've had take this on and, and move in this direction, really get a good benefit out of that. And, and part of what happens in along the way is that you become a student of business, not just of the countertop fabrication business, but business in general. And that's where having some, some good resources can be a big key to help you as you learn more about how to improve not just your business, but how you run your business. Uh, there are a lot of great books out there. Uh, e Myth Revisited. Um, Anthony and I, Anthony was talking a little bit before we came on board. A great book about you know business owners um, becoming less involved in the day to day, but thinking more about the business. There's a great, uh, there's a good management system around that called the Entrepreneurial Operating System. Uh, if you'd like to read, there's a book called Traction, which takes the concepts in E Myth and puts a lot of good structure around them. Uh, Anthony was talking about that in, in his business. You guys have had, do you want to give a quick summary of that, Anthony, for the folks who didn't hear that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, every business runs on some type of operating system. And I would say the majority of them is reactive. And that's why we feel like we do sometimes stuck in our businesses. What the EOS system is geared towards getting a business owner out of the business so that they can work on it and constantly inspect what you expect. So uh, it, it just really breaks down these things that we fundamentally do on a daily basis, gives language and then gives tools so that you can uh, create systems like we're already talking about. Uh, Particularly, one of the main tools that Traction gives you is start with your accountability chart. And I've heard that mentioned a few times, defining roles and responsibilities, uh, but highly recommend it. And uh, there's a lot of free information out there. So EOS and Traction, look it up. Yep. The book is called Traction. Uh, those of you who don't like to read books on, you know, not books on tape anymore, it's called Audible. Um, those are really good. There's a book called Rhythm that's good about some of this pace uh, that's, that's important, this cadence of management. Um, I've got a tool that talks about that, a free tool. If you go to fabricatorscoach.com, hit free tools and look for the management, um, management rhythm tool and download that. It's got some, some things that are kind of like a condensed version of traction, so to speak, a lot of the same concepts. Um, if you're struggling with making things happen, The Four Disciplines of Execution, uh, it's a really good book to, to kind of get you focused on that. And obviously, if you don't like to read, then then doing the audible thing is, is really helpful. Um, but as you spend more time working on the business, you're going to find out that there are things that you really need to know that, that you don't know yet. And, and books is a great way to get a lot of that. Another great way is podcasts. Um, we take all of these webinars and we convert them to podcasts and put them on Fabricators Coach podcast on most of your active podcast platforms. Um, in this business, uh, there's a guy named Aaron Crowley who does something called the Fab Lab podcast. Uh, really good information uh, from somebody who owned a shop for a couple dozen years. Um, there's another one out there called Countertop Success. A fellow named Stephen Alberts is really good at looking at this at the marketing side of the business, especially the B2C, the retail marketing side of the business. And he's got some good podcast episodes. So there's some really good resources like that that are out there. Uh, I think one of the best resources is other business owners, not just in this business, but also other people who own businesses in other industries. Uh, there are local groups you can get into, leadership type, peer-to-peer uh, -peer coaching groups, 
before this uh, session started up, we were talking a little bit about ISFA, I-S-F-A, which uh, just came back from their, their annual conference uh, a couple of days ago. Really good. Um, cost of that is low. There's uh, NSI, which is great for certification. Uh, Rockheads is a really good group. Artisan Group's a good group. If you're interested in things like that, those are groups that do a lot to, to help foster this peer-to-peer -peer learning. And while they have good presentations at their meetings and their conferences, a lot of times it's the time between those presentations where you can sit down, meet other fabricators, get to know them, pick their brains. Uh, I've talked to several people who they, they basically will tell you that they would not be where they are today except for those relationships, that those relationships are the things that help them learn more than anything else. Uh, so I think those are all good resources for you. One of the things I think is important as you go through this is to approach it all with, a, with the perspective of intellectual humility, you know, understanding that none of us really has all the answers uh, and, and looking to learn, looking to learn from people, be willing to consider a perspective might be a little different than, than what you've always thought. And that can sometimes be the key to you helping make that step to the next level. Um, about to run out of time here for an hour. Um, anytime I send articles out like this, I get questions from people and 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 they they ask, you know, get different things. And here's a couple that have come up. One of them is every time I set aside time to do this, I get interrupted. I just can't seem to make it work. I can't find that hour a week. I think what Shelby's talking about, taking some time on Saturday is great. Shelby, I hope you'll get to the point where you can take that time during the week and maybe have Saturdays for yourself. I uh, hope you hope you get there pretty quickly. Um, but I think it's important as you start carving out time and trying to get some time to focus to work just on the business and not be like every other employee in the business. I think it's important to kind of forgive yourself once in a while. None of us is perfect. Uh, as, as we get into these things and, and, and we stumble and they don't work, the key is don't give up. Keep after it. Yeah, maybe the wheels fell off and this week was horrible and you just couldn't find that hour. Okay, that happens. That's that's life. That's the nature of, of not just this business, but any small owner-run manufacturing-oriented type business. Um, so great. Didn't work this week? Fine. Schedule a time next week. Set it aside. Just work that much harder to make it happen. So forgive yourself and, and keep after. Don't give up. Um, the other thing I get a lot of is, uh, you know, people just don't, sometimes they don't like to read or they just don't have time to read. Uh, and that's understandable. And I think that's where Audible is really a, a big help. When I went to this conference in Florida, this past, during the early part of this week, I drove down and back and I had, I had Audible books teed up that had a great time listening to some things. It was a big help. So those are some things that hopefully can help you as you work through this. Um, I think it's really important as we look at making that transition from fabricator to business owner and then to improve how well we run our business. I think it's important to understand that, that your business is running exactly the way you have designed it to run. I'll say that again. Your business is running just like you've designed it to run. And if you're not happy with how it's running, then... Give me a call. I'll offer a free, customized, one-on-one -on -one assessment, walk through your business, look at what's going on, and, and make some recommendations to help you improve how you run that business. So if you're interested, contact information is here on, on the screen, uh, and I'll be glad to, to set that up with you and, and spend some time with you doing that. Um, I, the ad is still up here for the 10-week uh, workshop that I mentioned earlier. We're in the middle of that. Uh, I've talked with several people about it since we got started. We limit this to 10 companies, three people per company, so we can manage the size of the group. We think we'll offer this again, maybe early next year. If you're interested, uh, drop me a line and we'll put you on the list to let you know when that's going to come out. Uh, and we'll have that available. Uh, because if we do offer it again, I think we'll get a lot more interest as the economy continues to do whatever it's going to do, which doesn't look great, but who knows what it will look like. I think we'll get a lot of interest and we're all going to keep it limited to smaller groups so we can manage it well. So if you're interested, let me know. Uh, next month, uh, the article will be, uh, where will you be when the music stops? You know, if you remember the kids game, musical chairs, uh, music stops, you sit down and there's always one less chair. So somebody's always kind of out of luck. 
We'll talk about strategies for dealing with whatever this economy is going to be in the next couple of years, some specific things for, for dealing with a recession. But I want to thank you all for taking time out of your Friday. Um, I hope this has been helpful for you. Obviously, in an hour, there's only so deep we can get with this uh, or, or any topic. And uh, so I'm happy to hang out for you know another half hour or so and um, and just talk if folks have got questions. But those of you who have to go, we're at the end of our hour. And I thank you for the time and hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fabricators Coach Podcast. If you've got any additional questions about this particular episode or anything else, please check us out at fabricatorscoach.com. Thanks. Have a great day.